Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Before we jump in, I want to give a shout out to the Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. You're making the show happen. If you like this show, if you've learned something, please consider becoming a patron. You can find the link in the description. Uh, other ways to support the show would be to subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube and you haven't subscribed yet, hit that uh, subscribe button and notification bell. And um, above and beyond, if you guys really love the show, you can go to Apple Podcasts, leave me a five-star review and a comment. That would be huge. Now, for today's podcast, I have a special guest with me. I have Dr. Craig Carter, and we're going to be talking about his book, Contemplating God with the Great Tradition. And I wish that we had like nine hours to cover this because the book is super thick. It's got it. It's really comprehensive. Um, it's awesome. I really like it. But we're going to be mostly covering uh, his 25 theses on trinitarian classical theism and i'm i'm really excited let's just jump right in uh not waste any more time dr carter thanks so much for coming on the podcast uh thanks for having me i am excited to have you here i've seen you a lot on twitter and i usually agree with what everything you're saying and so i'm like man i gotta get this guy on and then looking into your work more i was not disappointed at all but this this newest book Contemplating God with the Great Tradition, Recovering Trinitarian Classical Theism. It's like the, the fruit of you changing your mind about your conception of God. And you thought you were, you know, before you thought you were in line with Nicene doctrine of God and, and you were holding a relational view of God. But as you got deeper into relational theology, you became kind of disillusioned with that view. So before we get into to more of the substance of your book, can, can we um, describe that view that you're recovering from? What is, you know, relational theism as it pertains to um, um, theistic personalism, theistic mutualism, and, and neoclassical theism, all these terms that, that people are throwing out today. Okay. Uh, well, in the prologue to the book, I talk about my journey. So I started out as a fundamentalist Baptist. I, I've been a conservative Baptist uh, pastor and theologian all my life. And when I did my PhD in Toronto, uh, University of Toronto, John Webster in the 90s, uh, Karl Barth was my major theologian. Uh, I did my thesis on John Howard Yoder, and um, during that time, I began to move toward pacifism and a uh, relational understanding of God, and uh, so I was reading people like John Zizioulis and Miroslav Volf and Stanley Grenz and Colin Gunton, um, people that were talking about uh, the the Cappadocians being the real Trinitarians and Augustine being a mere monotheist and and the whole East versus West thing, the Cappadocians supposedly start from the three, Augustine starts from the one. And they were promoting a view of God as inherently rational, relational, both within himself and in relation to the creation. Mm -hmm. So God is three persons who relate to each other um, as a family. And then God relate, that becomes a model or a, a, uh, a way of understanding a basis for human society. So um, after I wrote a book on John Howard Yoder and a follow-up book on social ethics in that tradition, I had a, a sabbatical in 2004 and I wanted to write a book on the doctrine of God. My idea was to take this relational concept of God and make it the basis for social ethics. That was where I started. So um, I got a contract and I went out to do research and made the mistake of actually reading the fourth century fathers for myself, which uh, is a bad thing to do if you just want to write a book and perpetuate your preconceptions. You, you had that line about C.S. Lewis. You can't be too careful who you're reading. And you appropriated uh, that. That was great. Lewis said, An a young atheist cannot be too careful about his reading. Um, and referring to himself when he was converted in his 20s to uh, to Christian theism. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, um, I read Lewis Ayers. Nicaea and its legacy, that was a life-changing book. But hmm. as I read Athanasius, the Cappadocians, Augustine, and uh, scholars like Ayers and Khalid Anatolios and John Baer and Francis Young and so many more, um, I began to realize that the whole East versus West thing was overblown, that uh, the Cappadocians were not social Trinitarians, that social Trinitarianism is a modern thing, and it was something they actually rejected. Um, I also began to realize that uh, the divide between them and Augustine was not. Now, I had always wanted to be Nicene. I never wanted to be unorthodox. I never wanted to try and be a heretic. And yeah. so, but I thought that I was being Nicene 
in 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 believing in relational theism. And so once I began to see that that whole modern narrative is not right, I be, I began to realize that you know, and this is not even controversial really in patristic studies. It's only controversial controversial among modern systematic theologians. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I began to rethink my whole doctrine of God, and so I began to realize that. The doctrine of God that was taught in classical orthodoxy, and I'm talking about the God of the Bible as revealed in the Old Testament, presupposed by Jesus, the God that is taught in the Nicene Creed by the by the Church Fathers, that Augustine passes on the, the heritage of the Fathers to the Middle Ages. Um, the, the locus classicus of the Christian doctrine of God is Thomas Aquinas' summary of it in the first 43 questions of the Summa Theologica. And um, this was presupposed by the reformers. It's explicitly confessed to the Protestant confessions. Um, it, it's taken for granted by the evangelical revivals, uh, people leading the evangelical revivals in the 18th century. And it's it's taught in the catechism of the Catholic Church. It's the basis of Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, Protestantism. It's just the, do the Christian doctrine of God. Yeah. Well, that doctrine of God, um, it became, for me, um, uh, you know, my, my the, I, I came out of that study with a much firmer grasp of of what it means to believe in the classical Christian doctrine of God, and I could see that the 20th century supposed revival of Trinitarian theology was not a revival, but a massive revision. Yeah. And the question is, why was it a revision? Why, why was Nicaea not recovered in the 20th century? So, I came to the con over. I'm, I'm I'm hurrying this up to make it quick. <laughs> Uh, but over a long period of time, I came to understand that the, the problem, the reason that the modern understanding of Trinitarian theology that you see coming from Bart and Rahner through Maltman and Pannenberg and, and Jensen and all the, all the, the, the modern theologians, they are operating in a different metaphysical context than the, than the tradition was operating in when it formulated the Christian doctrine of God. Mm -hmm which means that they're trying to fit a Christian doctrine of God into modern metaphysics. And that is where the whole thing goes off the rails. So that began, I began to probe and think about what that means. And one of the issues that it raised was, um, you know, it's pretty easy to, to show that if you take the Nicene fathers and then you take the 20, 20th century Trinitarian theology, that they're different. There's no problem to show they're different. Um, but if I say, well, they're different, so therefore we should reject the modern and embrace Nicaea, the objection would be, but you see, we have a better understanding of the Bible. They used allegory and they interpreted the Bible, read Greek philosophy in, and we read it the right way. And so our view is actually superior to the modern, to the Nicene view. Mm. That led me into having to write the first book, which was uh, Interpreting Scripture with the Great Tradition, to defend the pre-modern exegesis from this charge that it was inferior to modern historical critical study of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And that took a whole book. And so I came to understand that that, that Nicene doctrine, has, the Nicene Creed has three pillars, exegesis, doctrine, and metaphysics. Yeah. And that the metaphysics is, is imply, it comes out of the doctrine and it provides the conceptual framework for further exegesis. So you have you have exegesis that is done initially that per, that a whole lot of texts are studied and and uh, conclusions are drawn and doctrines are formulated and from those doctrines you get implications and some of those implications are metaphysical and then you 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 go back and you do exegesis all over again and you ask yourself would my exegesis change uh, if I had done it the first time consciously aware of these metaphysical implications. Like, let me give you an example to make this concrete. So you, you've got a whole lot of texts in the Bible, starting with Genesis 1-1, that deal with creation. Okay, fine. So you develop a doctrine of creation. And then you realize that, that what the Bible is teaching about creation involves creation ex nihilo. So you've got exegesis, you've got a doctrine of creation, you've got a metaphysical implication in creation ex nihilo. That means God is transcendent. That means God has a saity. That means all kinds of things. Well, then when you take that metaphysical worldview and you go back and you read the text again, you get even deeper insight and even deeper understanding of what is being revealed. So that's how I think it works. So that means that um, I'm in the middle of writing a trilogy. So <laughs> the the yeah. interpreting scripture is exegesis. Mm -hmm. Contemplating God is doctrine. And 
now, right now, what I'm working on is the third volume in the trilogy, which is on metaphysics, which is going to be doing metaphysics with the great tradition. And it's trying to state what are the metaphysical doctrines that the great tradition uses in doing exegesis. Hmm. In other words, how do we use our doctrinal framework to un get a deeper understanding of the scripture? Yeah, so that's that's the next step. Well, that sounds awesome. I'm I'm really excited about the next one. You got to come on and talk about that as well. Um, so, just a follow up on on the metaphysics of of the fathers. In your conception, is there um, their appropriation of Greek terminology and, and some Latin terminology in there. Um, is that um, you're taking the content of Christianity, the Christian metaphysics and metaphysical implications, and then just squeezing it through uh, Greek language? Or um, in your conception, is it that the Greeks did get this part right and um, God has, has you know, a appropriated that for us and saying, hey, listen to the Greeks here. This is right. Uh, and then departures from that is departure from Christianity. I, I'm, I'm hoping that this is making sense. So I'm thinking like the the role of every of every good systematic theologian is to speak, you know, the doctrines for their um, generation. And so I'm, I'm wondering, in your conception, is the metaphysics of the fathers uh, just appropriating the language and it's saying here here is what the Christian doctrine is, um, and and we could do it today with with different philosophy, just using different terminology, but the same content. Or is actually the Greeks got the content right and we need to hold on to that content? Well, I mean, all of this is very complicated. And and uh, and and I guess I would just say that um, it's really critical that we do this historically. Mm. We, we need to understand uh, what comes first and what comes second. Um, and, of course, the Greeks is um, right. way too vague because, yeah. uh, well, well, let me let me just try to systematically go walk through the stages here. So the Old Testament is written in an ancient Near Eastern mythological context. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, Canaan, and Mesopotamia, all around Israel, there are mythological cultures. What does that mean? Well, there's no creation ex nihilo. Um, there's no linear concept of history. Yeah. Uh, reality consists of matter in chaos. Chaos is fundamental. So you take the Babylonian uh, myth, uh, Enuma Elish, you basically have chaos, and then one of the gods comes along and fights the chaos monster. So Marduk fights Tiamat, the chaos monster, and establishes order. Out of her right. body, right? He, he kills right. her and he kills her and then spreads her body out and creates the, the cosmos, right? Right. And the myth, the myth is saying that the that the natural order that exists, which allows the Mesopotamian city-states to grow an excess of food through agriculture and increase the population and build cities and become a civilization. But this is all based on violent struggle yeah. to overcome the chaos at the beginning. And so, um, so rea reality then is not fundamentally rational. It is fundamentally based in violence. So the, the natural order, the, the rain that comes at the right time to make the crops grow, the fertility of the flocks, all of this is the result of the god winning the battle over the chaos monster. Yeah. That's why the, the civilization worships the god, so that he'll keep on maintaining this order so that society can continue. So the basis of the natural and the social order is uh, violence rather than reason. Sure. Now, in Israel, God reveals himself to Israel as the transcendent creator. So this means that God creates the world. Genesis 1 and 2 is what the mythological cultures did not have. The myths leave out Genesis 1 and 2 because what they because what Genesis 1 says is that it shows God creating matter out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And everything is calm and peaceful and God speaks and things obey his voice instantaneously. Everything arranges itself in order uh, and and the word of God orders the creation. Yeah. And so what this means is that creation is fundamentally good, not evil, mm -hmm. that, they, that the original state of it is order rather than chaos. Chaos gets introduced later in the fall after the, after the good creation is established. So this is, this is totally unique. There is no other story in the ancient Near East that, that tells this kind of a myth or this kind of a story about reality. Okay. As you've 
move forward through the intertestamental period into the New Testament period, Greco-Roman culture is also mythological. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, you have the Greek myths and you have Roman myths, but something really weird happens in the sixth century BC. A bunch of guys in um, part of Greece, Ionia, mm -hmm. begin to, to, to suppose, and we don't know why, but they begin to suppose that nature can be explained rationally, yeah. that nature operates according to laws. And so natural science comes into being. Thales, for example, predicts an eclipse. Yeah. How does he do that? Magic? No, natural <laughs> science. This is, science begins to develop. So you've got physics and metaphysics. Plato is the one who, um, uh, Plato and Socrates come along after the pre-Socratic philosophers, and they they say that um, that the cosmos, and by the way, that word cosmos comes into being for the first time because reality is now not, not matter in chaos, but fundamentally it is a cosmos. It's an ordered, structured whole that operates according to law that can be discerned by human reason. Yeah. This is this is the revolution that happens in Greek metaphysics. Now, Plato is most found something that we call the Platonic tradition, and the Platonic tradition by the time of Augustine is eight hundred years old. It's uh, it goes through Plato and Aristotle and the Middle Platonists and and others, and it comes down to the Neoplatonists of, of Augustine's time. And in this tradition, there is a belief that that the world has a uh, an ordered structured meaning that can be discovered by the human mind by reason yeah. and plato presupposes that this material world is based on something beyond the material world something that is immutable and eternal and perfect that is the cause of the change and flux because the problem is you have heraclitus on the one hand who says all is flux you have parmenides on the other hand who says nothing changes every change is just an illusion yeah. and both of them have a good point because there's a sense in which reality does exhibit change all the time. You know, Heraclitus is famous for saying you can't step in the same river twice. Parmenides, on the other hand, has a point too, because Parmenides says, yeah, but it, that river got its name a thousand years ago and it's still the same name, it's still the same river. Right. You know? And, he, and Parmenides he, is calling Zeno, right? In, in, in being a monist and saying there's no change. And Yeah. So you, I as a person was once a little microscopic cell and then I was a fetus and then I was a, a baby and then I was a, an adolescent and then I was a man and, and pretty soon I'll be a corpse laying in the ground and yet there'll be a headstone that will still have my name on it that my parents gave me. So there's one person who endures all through the changing fluctuations of life. Yeah. So how do you explain both change and continuity? That was yeah. the basic problem. Unity and diversity, yeah. Yeah, how do you explain the fact that, that change is real but there is some, but things don't just change randomly and in, in flux, but rather there's an order and structure in the world despite the change. That's, that, that's what Plato's wrestling with. And of course, his theory of the forms comes out of that. And, and really, that is the big, that's the beginning of science. That's the beginning of looking at nature as a cosmos. Yeah. Okay. But, but philosophy never took over Greece or Rome. Greece mm -hmm. and Rome as societies were predominantly mythological. <laughs> And the philosophy was confined to a small group of intellectuals who had two problems. Number one, they could never really um, they could never really impose their view on the society as a whole. They could never really get their Greece or Rome to become philosophical. Uh, Aristotle tried educating Alexander the Great, didn't go so well, uh, and and uh, Plato tried. Uh, lots of lots of them tried. So. The basic problem was this. Philosophy could identify God, the, the fact that there must be a God. Mm -hmm. that, that is a, an immutable, eternal, unchanging uh, first cause of the universe. But it could not tell you anything about him or how to get to him or relate to him or know him personally. Mm -hmm. This is what Justin Martyr says in his in his dialogues. He says, you know, I, I, was, I went through all the schools of philosophy and I, I got to the Platonists and they were the best and I was waiting... They told me about God, and I was waiting and waiting until we could get to the point where they would explain to me how I could know God, and they never did. Yeah. And then he meets a guy walking on the beach who tells him about the Hebrew prophets, introduces Christianity. He becomes a Christian. Christianity gets him into a personal relationship with God. Yeah. So he sees Christianity as the fulfillment of the Platonic quest. The other problem that the Greek philosophers had was this. 
They could identify virtue, but they could not tell you how to be virtuous. They could not give you the power to be virtuous. They could identify what virtue is. Oh, it's courage, temperance, prudence, and so on. But they couldn't make you courageous. Right. They, they couldn't make you temperate. They couldn't, they had no way to help a person overcome the base desires that drag us down and to be self-disciplined. Oh, the Stoics tried self-discipline and it worked for a certain intellectual elite to a certain extent, but 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 they they could never make it a mass movement. They could never they could never bring society along with them. Yeah. So that's the situation that the fathers encountered when they when they began to uh, to do their their work as it began to to preach the gospel to the Greco-Roman world. They 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 were had to encounter Greek philosophy along with mythology and polytheism and all of all, all the elements of society. But, 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 but when they, when they were asked, when they had wrestled with the struggle, when they struggled with this question, how does the God of the Bible relate to the God of the philosophers? Mm -hmm. So if you said, well, they're two different gods, well, that can't be right because the Bible says there's only one true God. Right. And yet the church fathers were not willing to say Plato's crazy. They weren't willing to say there's no first cause of the universe. It's just it, they wouldn't want to go back to the ancient Near Eastern myths. So um, so the, the answer they came up with was to say that the God of the Bible is more than the God of the philosophers, but not less. Yeah. The God of the Bible is the first cause of the universe. That's what we mean by the Christian doctrine of creation. The God of the Bible, though, is personal, unlike the unlike the God of Stoicism. So John in John chapter one says in the beginning was the word and he talks about the logos and that's a that's a loaded Greek philosophical term that mm -hmm. the Stoics used for the principle of rationality at the heart of the universe and John says he became flesh that the logos is personal so so the, the, the so the the strategy that they used was to um, was to take the best of Greek philosophical ideas the ones that were true like that God is the first cause of the universe, that the that materialism is not true, etc. And they and the, so they rejected the atomists, they rejected the Epicureans, they rejected the Stoics, but they said, well, the Platonists have a few good ideas yeah. to build on. <clears throat> basically the approach that they took. So um that that's how the church fathers they they created something called Christian Platonism. And what that is is simply um uh Augustine is um is is taking the neoplatonism of his time and he is adding to it that he's rejecting certain aspects of it but he's adding to it doctrines of incarnation and creation ex nihilo and he is basically creating a christian platonism that is an alternative to neoplatonism and the two struggled for dominance in christian platonism won. yeah and that's that's where christian platonism came from so that means that bound up in the christian so long answer to the question but we're getting there yeah bound up in the Christian doctrine of God that comes forward in history are certain metaphysical truths, such as that God is pure act, that God is, that God is unchanging, that God is a saity, that God is simple. And these metaphysical truths are seen by the tradition as overlapping, yes, with Greek philosophical ideas, but as conveying the truth about the God of the Bible. Yeah. So that they become part of the warp and woof of the Christian doctrine of God. The problem with modernity is that in the Enlightenment, the whole Christian Platonist tradition is rejected. And they go back and they pick up ideas from ancient philosophy like materialism and skepticism and 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 Epicureanism, which is deism is just a new form of it. Mm -hmm. So so what they're doing is they're rejecting some of the philosophical, metaphysical ideas that the church fathers saw as integral to the Christian doctrine of God. And that's why we're in such a confused situation today. Yeah. That's why the modern Trinitarian revival, we're trying to have Trinitarianism in a writer like um, Jensen or Moltmann uh -huh. with, with a doctrine of God, which is not Christian. The, the, the basic doctrine of God is not Christian. And so the Trinitarian part that's added to that doctrine of God is not really Christian Trinitarianism. So it's not nice seen because even though he talks about Father, Son, and Spirit, he's not talking about the one God revealed in Scripture, the God who reveals himself to Israel. He's talking about a God who is a part of the cosmos and in relation to the cosmos and changes with the cosmos and evolves together with the cosmos. 
that sort of thing is um, is closer to the ancient myths than it is to to uh, the Christian doctrine of God. Yeah. Long answer. No, that was a great answer. I, I really appreciate it. So, um, just there's a, there's so many lines that I want to I want to trace, but I'll, I'll I'll keep it to a few. Um, would you say that uh, would you put Aristotle in the Platonic tradition? So those those yeah. you know Thomas, everyone he's a oh. Neo-Aristotelian, but you're saying that that's included in in yeah. uh, Christian Platonism. Yeah, Aristotle is Thomism is a kind of Christian Platonism. Augustinianism is a kind of Christian Platonism. Uh, I in the book I talk about Reformed Thomism. Yep. which would be something like Turretin and John Owen and people that come after the Reformation who are adopting Thomistic ideas, but they're doing it along with the five solos of the Reformation. And they are, they are Protestant, but they are also uh, using Thomistic ideas. They stand, theirs is a kind of Christian Platonism. C.S. Lewis is probably the most famous Christian Platonist of the 20th century. Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. So some people might say, well, you know, um, the, Especially if they're if they're using the Hellenization thesis, but they would say, you know, this is just an accident of history that um, Augustine looked up from his Bible, and who could he interact with? Well, the the Platonists there, um, which is which is weird because the Platonists of his time were skeptics. They were, you know, the acad academicians by Augustine's time were were skeptics, and Plato's spinning in his grave. But uh, I guess maybe not the Neoplatonists. But um, you would say. I think I would say maybe, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that God superintended all of history anyways. And so he led uh, this time of uh, the, the Neoplatonists. He, he he guided and led Augustine to read who he read, if it was Plotinus or whoever. And uh, there it wasn't an accident of history because God's sovereign over history. And so there's a reason why he was engaging with the Neoplatonists instead of, um, you know, a, a proto uh, Hegel or something. Well, I do think that, uh, you know, that was pretty much assumed by all Orthodox Christian theologians up until the 19th century. Hmm. The, the idea that the provident, providential provision of Greek philosophy, um, and, and not just philosophy, but natural science and and uh, uh, physics and metaphysics, um, yeah. that, 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 that Christianity interacted with those. In, because what that did was it, it gave the Christian doctrine of God a lasting value, because even today, um, you know, when we confess the Nicene Creed, we're confessing a theology that has already taken into account the basis for natural science, yeah. and so it's not outdated by natural science. Right. The whole idea that science and Christianity are in opposition is is just totally wrong, right. and and the Hellenization theory is complete bunk. <laughs> it's it's you know. Paul Gravilliuk, in chapter one of his book, The Sufferings of the Impassable God, um, he, he makes some, some very salient points here. For, for one thing, the idea that there's such a thing as Greek thought um, or a Greek conception of God is ridiculous because most there, there's such a wide variety. There's a spectrum of opinions. And the mythology uh, has a view of God that is God is changeable, God is finite, God is, um, you know, the God, the Greek gods get jealous, they get angry, they 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 fight, they, they, they the I, Aristotle's God is just one view among many Greek views. Yeah. And and, and so what they do is they they, they, they they develop this polarization between Greek philosophy on the one side and the biblical view on the other side. And so the Greek philosophy is 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 multiform, not not uniform, and the biblical idea of God shows God as both immutable and transcendent, and also as personal and involved. So the biblical view is more complicated than than the, what they want to they want they want they want us to believe that the Bible only teaches that God is personal, like a person. He acts in history, and that's all the Bible says about him. Right, and that. All that the Greeks say is Aristotle's unmoved mover. And then they want to say, they want to take the unmoved mover versus the God of the Bible and say they don't come, they're not. Well, both on both sides, they're being unrealistic because Greek philosophy is more complicated. The Bible is more complicated. What is really, what the fathers were doing was trying to sort out how do we, how do we pick and choose certain ideas from the Greek side and where do they fit with ideas from the biblical side. Revelation is the final authority. Yeah. The question is, what have the Greeks said that is true that we need to, because look, 
you don't want to go preaching. You don't want to go, you don't want to be Paul in Acts 17, going into Athens and saying something like what you hear certain anti-intellectual Christians saying today. You don't want Paul going in there saying, oh, you guys, you philosophers, you scientists, that's all just intellectual stuff. We, we just know God mystically spoke to me through the Bible. And he said, this is true. This is true. This is true. Believe it. That's it. Yeah. You know, you, if you present the gospel that way, then you're, you're basically saying it's anti-intellectual. It's just a, it's just a leap in the dark. It's just a, it's just a, it's just a, a it's just another myth. Mm -hmm. That That's just another mystery religion. What you want is for Paul to go in there and say, look, there are certain things that the philosophers have said that are true, such as the principle of causality, such as the idea that there's a first cause of the universe, such as this material world is not all there is. Yeah. And let me explain to you a, a, a biblical doctrine of creation, which makes sense of those, the best beliefs of, of, of the best philosophers, so that we can understand that all truth is God's truth. And we can understand that the biblical doctrine that what I'm preaching is is the truth about reality. And that's why you should embrace it. Fundamentally, you should become Christians because it's true. Yeah. That's what you want Paul to say. And that's what he did say. Hey, man, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you brought that up as well, because it's, uh, I think a lot of times people who will just repent and believe like, yeah, we need to repent and believe. You You have to present that to people. But who who are more anti-intellectual, as you said, they think it's so important. It's it's too important for me to get bogged down in these intellectual conversations. And actually, it's too important for you to respond that way. It's way too important for you to not engage them and also not recognize common grace, which is a staple in Christian theology and always has been. And so you, you, you ought to affirm that and offer them the chance to have a more systematic take on the world, as well as forgiveness of sins and, and you know regeneration and life with their creator. Yeah, that's right. What we don't want is for people to feel they have to choose between mm. their mind and and religion. Yeah. We don't want them to 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 think about it. they have to sacrifice their intellect. Um and uh and and really the idea that Christianity is against science is a a um it's a it's a um it's propaganda that comes out of the enlightenment out of the French enlightenment which is uh it's just it's just talking points trying to do to it's a it's really sophistry is what it is actually mm -hmm. plato knew these people he, he had met them already they were the sophists they were people who did not believe that there is any such thing as truth that we can know yeah and and so truth becomes a pragmatic weapon for them to use to get ahead so the ideas become just just things that we can use that if i if, if i suspect that you are for example if I suspect that you come from a culture where women are put on a pedestal and to be protected, then I will accuse you of being anti-women uh, because you believe in Christianity. Because I know that you'll respond to that. Yeah. Emotionally, the, you don't want to be called anti-women. You mm -hmm. don't want to be called a chauvinist. And so I know I can manipulate you using that. I don't care about social chauvinism. I don't care about women. I don't care about any of that. What I care about is getting you to submit to my belief. That's what sophism, sophistry is. It, it's not about a search for the truth. It's about a way to find ideas to manipulate your audience into doing what you want them to do. Yeah. And this is um, this is this is all around us today. And it was all around the church fathers, and it was all around Socrates and and Plato. We like the more things change, the more they stay the same. Right. Right. So we need to we need to understand that the search for truth is what Christians are about. We we believe in Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So what we're doing when we do philosophy is trying to separate the truth from the error. Yeah. And we're trying to see what accords with scripture. And yeah. what is and 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 that's what that that's what theology, that's what the historical theological tradition has been about. And which by the way, it's a point we we mentioned before we went on the air, uh, up until the modernity, Philosophy and theology were not separate things in separate containers done by separate people in separate departments. They were they were one one search for truth, yeah. and um, and the 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 separation of philosophy from theology and the Enlightenment has been for the purpose of dechristianizing it. Hmm. Um, and so we 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 should never be we should never take these disciplinary boundaries too seriously. Yeah.
I think it's a great point. I, th I think maybe Kant was the first like professional philosopher. So before that, yeah, everyone was, they were thinking and they were thinking um, holistically from, from their, their point of view. I love that about Augustine that he's, he's one of ours, you know, and, and everyone has to acknowledge him as, as one of the greatest thinkers of the whole Western world, maybe the world all, all together. Uh, his view of time and uh, autobiography, and and he's the father of all these different things. I love, I love that we get him. Uh, well, Dr. Carter, I wanted to get into um, your twenty five theses, and there's a couple that I wanted to focus in on more, uh, uh, take some more time and, and focus in on. So maybe I'll just list them, and if you have something you wanted to uh, jump in on, just just feel free to jump in on. But uh, I'll stop and and ask uh, uh, you questions about the ones that I'm really. Uh, intrigued by they're they're all intriguing, but certain ones where I would need clarification. Does that sound cool? Okay, yeah, awesome. All right, so um, we call them Carter's uh, twenty five rules for theology, following the uh, Jordan Peterson type motif. There, uh, one is uh, Christian theology consists of the doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ, derived from Holy Scripture, not from opinions of mere human beings. Amen. That's awesome. Uh, thesis two: Theology is a study of God and all things in relation to God. I love that. I think it's a really succinct definition of theology. I'm going to be appropriating that myself. Three, theology can be divided into two parts. One, what is taught explicitly in scripture. And two, what may be deduced from what is taught explicitly in scripture. Awesome. It sounds very, very much like the uh, Westminster Confession there. Uh, four, Christian theology consists of exegesis, doctrines, and metaphysical implications of doctrine, which form the context of further exegesis. And uh, this, this we've talked about this one already, but I really liked, you made this point about uh, Hellenization and Hegelization, and, uh, or Hegelization, however you pronounce uh, it. Why, why do we think that Hellenization is bad and Hegelianization is fine? Why are the Greeks bad and the Germans okay? <laughs> right. Well, and another point, maybe you could just uh, delve into this a little bit, is that um, no exegesis is presuppositionless. And that's not even really the goal is to get to a presuppositionless exegesis and the same thing goes for our doctrines and our metaphysics. Can you explain that a little bit for us? Well, okay, so here's the problem. All exegesis involves using presuppositions. So if we want the presuppositions to be derived from the scripture mm -hmm. and not from non-scriptural sources and so that we can be sure that they're true presuppositions, how do we get the presuppositions without doing the exegesis? We've got a chicken and the egg problem, which comes first. So I think that the solution to the problem is, is that, that we do exegesis, we formulate our doctrines, we reflect on the metaphysical implications of those doctrines, we go back and we do exegesis, what I call the second exegesis. We do exegesis again, where we ask ourselves, would my exegetical result change if I had done it the first time consciously assuming these metaphysical presuppositions. And, and if so, then it's time to change it. And, and so this is what I refer to as deepening our understanding of, of. So rather than a linear, you know, the fourfold division of theology into exegetical, historical, systematic, and practical theology, mm -hmm. this is another modern invention that I want to get rid of. <laughs> this, this, is, this presupposes a linear process whereby you start with the Bible with objective, neutral, no presuppositions. You just start with the Bible and you objectively figure out what the Bible says. You get your exegesis, then you move on to the historic history of it and the doctrine. And it, it presupposes that you can have people over here in the Department of Biblical Studies doing their thing. And people over here in the Department of Systematic Theology doing their thing. And I just think this is this is this is something that was invented in the with the emergence of the German Research University in the 19th century. This is not the way Christian theology was done for the first 1800 years. Yeah. This is not the right way to do it because you have to be constantly in this spiral. So you start with exegesis, you start with, you get doctrines, you get metaphysics, you get deeper exegesis, revised doctrines, better metaphysics, and you keep going on and on forever. I think the highest form of theology is commentary and scripture. Hmm. And I think that scripture has levels of meaning and, and it's, it's not, it's not best understood with just um, uh, by attempting to be neutral in your presupposition. The best way to, to get to the deepest meaning of scripture is to read scripture from within its own 
uh, conceptual framework to to read. Well, let me give you an example. Yeah. If you read Genesis 1-1, now we've got a debate going on between scholars today, and Old Testament scholars. Does Genesis 1-1 teach creation ex nihilo, or is it just kind of like a title for the beginning? And does the action really start with verse two with the unformed matter? And some people want to read Genesis, they say, in the light of the ancient Near Eastern world. So they say, well, other, other ancient Near Eastern documents begin with matter in motion and chaos. And so that's where we should expect Genesis to begin. So we're going to interpret Genesis 1-1 as kind of just like a, a title introducing the chapter. Um, the problem with that is I believe that Genesis 1, Genesis 1 is written and should be interpreted in its historical context. But it is a polemic against the ancient Near Eastern myths. Right. It's not reflecting the myths. It's correcting the myths. Yeah. So therefore, when you read it that way, and then when you read the rest of the Bible and you get the doctrines, uh, the doctrine of creation ex nihilo in texts like Psalm 33 and Hebrews 11 and, yeah. and Romans and Acts and all these places, I, I spell them all out in the book. Then you go back and you read Genesis 1-1 and it's, it's so obvious this is what it's saying. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is, you can see the deep meaning of Genesis 1-1 now because you can see that in contrast to the myths, the God of the Bible is a transcendent creator who can act into history to, to change things in history, but he's not limited to history. He's not, he's not acting from within history. He is the creator from outside. He has transcendence. He has a saiety. He is immutable and perfect. And the creation is his creation. When you, so, so what I'm saying is that, that you can't, um, you can't just read the Bible once and think you've got it now, and now you're going to go on and do something else in systematics. There's this continuous process. So, so if we break down these disciplinary barriers and get the Old Testament scholars to be better theologians and get the theologians to be better Old Testament scholars, we're going to get better theology. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's great. I, I would love to toss the philosophers in there as well. So, um, so you mentioned, uh, I think in the book you might have said circle, hermeneutical circle, but maybe you said spiral as well. So I'm, I'm thinking of like Grant Osborne, uh, the spiral, and what some people have talked about is if you have this conception of a hermeneutical circle or spiral, you never get to the the, the true meaning. And, and for some reason, this is like a big problem for people. What, what, do, you, what do you make of that? That uh, have, you, have you heard that before? The circle is very different than the spiral. Okay. The, the, the spiral implies progress. Sure. We're getting but closer. Do we ever get there? I guess that's that's the claim that people make. You, you you never end up getting there. And for me, I'm like, well, you're going deeper in, and and you're getting closer and closer. You're having more understanding. But, um, okay. The finite cannot comprehend the infinite. Mm -hmm. The the finite, uh, I I could say it in Latin. The finite does not contain the infinite. Mm -hmm. And this is a basic principle that the creature creator distinction yeah. um there's two important things to remember when you're doing theology just two basic rules that if you follow these rules you'll never go wrong these are carter's rules <laughs> number one there is a god number two it isn't me yeah. the creature creator distinction is the key so if we if we understand that god is not it is it is we don't want to go, we, we can go wrong in two ways. We can go into a complete apophaticism where we yeah. say the human mind cannot comprehend God at all, cannot understand God at all, cannot know God at all. We can we can get into a kind of a deism where God is so remote that we cannot really get to him at all. Mm -hmm. Or we can say that we can comprehend God. Augustine said, if I comprehend it, it's, if I understand it, it's not God. Yeah. And so the, the idea is that because human beings are created in the image of God, the logos by which God creates the universe is imprinted into the soul of the human being, which means that our minds have reason, mm -hmm. part of our image. As image bearers, our reason allows us to use language. And God uses language to reveal truth to us. So what God reveals in scripture is true as far as it goes, but it never is comprehensive truth about himself because yeah. there's no way that the human being can comprehend God completely. Mm -hmm. But it is important to say that we can know God without comprehending God. 
Yeah. We can know God truly. Everything we know is true, and we can be sure that it's true because of the way that Revelation has been structured to culminate in Jesus Christ with the incarnation. Mm -hmm. um, but 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 we don't want to go off the rails by saying we can't know God at all, and we don't want to go off the rails by saying we can comprehend God completely. But we want to say that we can know God truly without knowing God exhaustively. Yeah, we can know Him truly without knowing Him fully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, so so moving on to the next point, and we we've covered a couple of these already, just just in in breaking some of this down. So God's existence is evident to reason, even though fallen human beings, because of sin, either deny God's existence or refuse to be grateful to Him, and worship Him. And so you'd mentioned that uh, you studied under Webster uh, during his Bart phase, and so this, do you see this as a as a departure from from Bart's uh, you know nine his his rejection of natural theology? Yeah, Bart was wrong. Nice. Awesome. I agree with you. <laughs> he, he was just, he was, he was way out of step with the tradition. Yeah. Um, and he was rea reacting to, to the people of his time, right? He was trying to react against the, the Nazism that was coming in. And well, I think it's deeper than that. Um, okay. I think that the, um, I think the real issue is this. Bart never challenged Kant head on. Hmm. He never refuted Kant. Bart tried, so so little history here. David Hume, uh, rep, he's a culmination of the skepticism of the, of the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So he denies the principle of causality. It's very telling that the way that, that, that Hume had to go that far in order to deny the validity of the proofs for the existence of God. He yeah. had to go so far as to not deny the principle of causality. Which means that it's like it's like shooting an ant with a with a cannon because he 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 not only got rid of the proofs for the existence of God he also undermined natural law natural moral law and natural science scientific mm -hmm. law I mean when you deny the principle of causality you're basically heading toward Nietzsche and nihilism yeah. so he but that's what he had to do to get rid of the proofs of the existence of God unfortunately Kant believed that Hume and the rest of the Enlightenment had been correct and had um, undermined proofs of the existence of God, and therefore he rejected all the, the cosmological proof, the Aristotelian proof, he rejected all that, and he tried to reconstitute um, a basis for, for science with his critical philosophy. Yeah. Hegel came along and said, um, okay, we're going to now work within a philosophical naturalism, and so he devises a metaphysics which is based on change and flux. He, he basically prioritizes Heraclitus above Parmenides, and he, he creates a, 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 a system. Most of Protestant liberalism followed Hegel, but they were presupposing Kant, because Kant denies knowledge. He denies, you can't know the thing in itself. This Kant is anti-Plato. Kant Kantianism is the rejection of Platonism. Platonism says we can know things, not perfectly, not absolutely, completely, but we can have true knowledge of things because we can know the natures of things. And the natures of things participate in universals. And because we can know the universals with our minds, we can know the natures of things. That's how we know, that's how science works. We, we know what the nature of things is. We can predict it, the behavior of things based on that. And Kant denies this. So, yep. so Protestant liberalism follows along with Hegel. Bart, Bart wants to get back to Christian orthodoxy. Bart wants to teach doctrine of God as creator. Bart wants to teach the incarnation. Bart wants to teach classical Christian orthodox doctrine. So what he does, though, is he tries to do an end run around Kant rather than refuting Kant head on. Rather than saying, no, Kant, you're wrong. Plato was right. The tradition was right. We need to go back to classical metaphysics. He says, no, we're, we're not, he's, I'm not, not going to say anything about Kant. What I'm going to do is make all Christian theology based on Christology. Hmm. We're going to, we're going to derive all of Christian theology. So what you notice is that in the first volume of the church dogmatics, the doctrine of the Trinity occupies the place where the proofs for the existence of God would, would have been in scholastic Protestant theology. Yeah. So what he does is he, he gets rid of the proofs of the existence of God, which eliminates the need for him to challenge Kant mm -hmm. and Hume. And he and he grounds theology in, in Christology. But here's the problem. 
is Christology depicting reality? Mm -hmm. Like, is it, it, how does Christology relate to the cosmos? Like, like the proofs of the existence of God show that Christianity is an interpretation of reality because we say that reality, the world around us, the world of change, that we can start with the fact of change and reason to the existence of God. There's a connection. In Bartianism, the question that is the perennial question is, is there any connection? Yeah, how do we even get started? Yeah. Now, is Christology based on anything, or is it just like a myth, a free-floating myth that that is a, a a story that we tell about the world? Yeah. And this fits into 20th century ideas, pragmatism, and so on. And you see a lot of the the post-liberal theology today is 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 based on this idea that well, well, what we do is we and the, even the concept of worldview, we tell stories about reality. Mm -hmm. And the concept of worldview is arises in post-Kantian uh, German philosophy in the 19th century. And the idea of a, of a worldview as it operates in evangelical circles today, you have a worldview, I have a worldview, she has a worldview, we all have our worldviews. Yeah. And worldviews are just our subjective perceptions of reality. They're stories we tell about reality. And if I can tell my story convincingly enough, maybe I can get you to believe my story. Yeah. Or maybe I can get you to change a feature of your story and agree with a feature in my story if I can tell my story well enough. Mm -hmm. And that that idea of worldview is quite different from the idea of metaphysics, as it has been traditionally understood in in, in philosophy. Because when when we when when we talk about what what Augustine believed about metaphysics, he was believing that the metaphysical proof for the existence of God, for example, is true. It's actually true. It's objectively true. Whether you like it or don't like it, it's it's not just one of the many worldviews. It's the true. Mm -hmm. And so and what I'm saying is that this idea of worldview becomes very subjective. So the question is, is Bartianism just another worldview? Mm -hmm. this, this is the, this, it, and, and is, is Christianity just another worldview? Or is it the truth about reality? That's what's at stake here. Yeah. That's that's really good. Yeah, that, that's really insightful as well to, to think about Bardianism uh, in in that light. So I'm gonna go some more rapid fire. I don't I don't think we'll be able to get through all of them. But uh, God is the first cause of all that <clears throat> exists, but is not Himself caused, uh, since existence is part of His own essence. Uh, and you cite Exodus three fourteen there. Uh, I am who I am. Uh, next one, God has aseity or independence from creation. While creation is dependent on God, the reverse is not true. Again, Amen. Uh, the next one, God is eternal, which means that he is neither beginning. Uh, he has neither beginning nor end as all creatures do. Just maybe a, a quick follow up here. God is eternal. Um, do, you, do you recognize that eternal temporal distinction that, you know, some philosophers want to say God is everlasting. Um, uh, so he, he does have an aspect of time to his being versus there is no time in, in God at all. God doesn't experience time in, in the eternality language. Well, now we're getting into the issue that is divides classical theism from the modern relational theism. Yeah. Um, yes, I follow the tradition here, which is which says that God is timeless. You notice the way time and space work. We we say that God is above time, so he's a spatial metaphor to describe his relationship to time, and we say that he is before all things, so we use a temporal metaphor to distinguish him from. Uh -huh. Temporality, and what what we're doing is we're bumping up against the limits of human language here. Yeah, because all human language has to arise out of experience, and so we use analogies from our experience. And we are creatures of space and time, and we cannot we're, we're in space and time. There's no way for us to really talk about space and time. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to talk about God as 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 outside and beyond space and time, as not confined to them, not not in them, not not, not, um, not. God does not occupy one point on the timeline. He's not in 1922, uh, and he's not in 3016. He, he is. All points on the timeline are simultaneously uh, present to God. Yeah. And and all places are simultaneously present to Him. Mm -hmm. So He is not. He. he what would the best way to think about this is. To think of being a creature of space and time as having two limitations, spatial and temporal, and then to think of God as not having those limitations, and therefore that's perfection. Right. So, so it's a relational theism, as I understand it, is 
um, is what in that thesis you just quoted is that God. This is um, this is Aquinas' theory of mixed relations. God affects the world, but the world does not affect God. The world God changes the world, but the world does not change God. Yeah. And what we see all through the 20th century, uh, from Hegel onwards, uh, is is a collection of views which um, which all see God as being changed by the world in some way. Hmm. That and so, if you want to throw that chart up there for a second, yeah, let's do that. Um, that I sent to you. Um, One second here. Across the bottom of the chart, you're going to notice a, a series of of uh, views, which are going to go from left to right, and they're from a sort of a more liberal to a more conservative uh, spectrum. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we make it as big as we can. Yep. All right, how's that look? Okay, so across the bottom, you can see if you can read them, you've got God is history, Hegel and Pannenberg. You've got process theology. You've got um, uh, ecological theology. You've got dynamic panentheism, theistic mutualism, and theistic personalism. So I just want to go through those. You notice that I, I've identified the two on the right as being evangelical. Mm -hmm. So you, there are evangelical examples of these. Um, James Dolezal's book, All That Is in God, uh, gives a list of people who are, are examples of theistic mutualism. <laughs> the mutualism is where you you posit, as uh, some theologians do, that God is immutable in one part of his being, but not immutable in another part of his being. Mm -hmm. Part of him changes in relation to the creation of God. <laughs> he doesn't. Now, why would people say something like that? Well, because you go back to the top of the chart, you have classical theism. Okay. Classical theism, you, you notice that you have the Platonic tradition, the biblical tradition. The Platonic tradition comes down through Plato, Aristotle, Middle Platonism to Neoplatonism. Then you have uh, the biblical tradition that the Old Testament, New Testament is interpreted by the church fathers. In the fourth century, Trinitarian classical theism uh, um, uh, crystallizes. So the classical theism has a lot in common with <coughs> but not everything in common. Mm -hmm. And by putting that word Trinitarian in front of it, we're, we're signaling that it is Platonism as it has been modified and corrected and supplemented by Christian revelation, by biblical yeah. revelation. This makes it Trinitarian or Christian classical theism, some people call it. Now, relational theism, uh, there's many kinds of it. There's the ancient Near Eastern and Greco-Roman mythology. There's Stoicism as a kind of pantheism. Epicureanism is a kind of deism. You've got atheism and materialism. These were some of the other options that were available to the church fathers as they thought about the problem. So if you take the ones that have developed on the liberal side of Christianity in the 20th, 20th century has not been a good century for theology. It, it, it was a bad century. Yeah. And, um, and liberal Protestantism as J. Gresham Machen wrote in 1923 in his book, Christianity and Liberalism, he said, liberalism is another religion. Right. He was right. Mm -hmm. And you can see that those things, um, God, the, the panentheism and the process theology, that is, those things owe more to ancient Near Eastern mythology and, and pantheism than they do to Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now, on the right-hand side, what you see in theistic mutualism and theistic personalism are the most conservative attempts to combine classical theism with the modern relational ideas. That the metaphysics coming out of Kant and Hegel have been so dominant that they have constituted a kind of a context. And in this context for the last 200 years, all theology has felt, well, we've got to somehow accommodate to this context. We've got to engage this context. We've got to somehow make our, our that Christian doctrine comprehensible in this context. We've got yeah. to somehow, this is what I call the liberal project. The liberal project is the project of fitting Christianity into modern metaphysics. That's hmm. the liberal project. It's got two wings. There's a historical critical wing stemming from Spinoza, and which really comes to the fore in the 19th century. That is reinterpreting the Bible within a philosophical naturalist uh, metaphysics. Then you've got the other wing is the doctrinal revisionist wing stemming from Schleiermacher. And that is where you are trying to revise Christian doctrines like sin or creation mm -hmm. or whatever in the context of modern metaphysics. Yeah. 
So what I'm saying is in the 20th century, everybody's playing the game called the liberal project. The, the liberals are going, you know, are going way off in the, in the direction of pagan mythology with process theology and so on, goddess worship, the whole thing. And so we, we look down our noses at them as evangelicals and we say, oh, they're crazy. We're not going that far. We're not, we're not interested in that. We're, we're going to do a very conservative version of the, of the liberal project. And so the way that conservative, yeah. and you see this both in conservative evangelical biblical studies as well as in doctrinal studies, we're going to purchase respectability in the modern academy at, for the cheapest possible price right. with the fewest possible mm -hmm. reasons to classical doctrine. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, so if you get, for example, theistic personalism, Theistic personalism is a concept of God as a being among beings. God is a God who is on the same plane of reality as cosmos. And he, he's the biggest and the strongest and the oldest and the wisest. He's, he's the most perfect being, but he's a being. Yeah. And basically, God in theistic personalism is not transcendent. That's, that's the big problem. He's not a transcendent creator. He's, but... You can say many things about the theistic personalist God, and he sounds biblical. Mm -hmm. He judges, he saves, he does miracles, he you can have a personal relationship with him. Well, the problem here is that theistic personalism is making some key concessions to modern metaphysics that it ought not to make. Mm -hmm. And you see this, for example, the, the typical concessions that tend to get made have to do with simplicity, uh, aseity, um, impassibility. Those are the most, simplicity and, uh, and impassibility are the two, uh, and God's timelessness. Those yeah. are the ones that tend to get compromised. Mm -hmm. um, and what's going on there is there's an attempt to establish this dialogue and work together toward a common, it's, it's the liberal project in action. It's a conservative version of the liberal project. And what, I'm, what I want to say to evangelicals is, Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Yeah. You know, let's not play the game. Hmm. Let's just not play the game. I I don't think that modernity has earned the right for Christians to take modern metaphysics into account when stating the Christian faith. I think modernity is a hot mess. Mm -hmm. I think modern culture is in the process of falling apart because of this metaphysics. So why would we want to make peace with it? Why would we want to accommodate to it? Why would we want to produce a version of Christianity that incorporates some of the modern metaphysics into the classical understanding? Why would we do that? Mm. It, it's in the process of falling apart. It, it's, 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 um, it's degenerated into relativism and skepticism and nihilism. Like in our culture, people think that a man can become a woman by deciding to. Mm -hmm. like, like, why do we want to accommodate to that? Yeah. What we need to do is to provide a clear alternative to it. Because when our culture falls, somebody's got to be around to pick up the pieces and start over again. Yeah. And that happened once before in Western history, and the church was was around to pick up the pieces. And I think it's going to happen again. Yeah. Well, so um yeah, that's that's insightful. Um I'm I'm thinking, what about those who would say, um, yeah, the 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 ancient conception or the the class uh, trinitarian or christian classical theistic conception is good um uh, but but it's there's some things that need to be clarified like like uh modal collapse or can we have a aseity without a tight you know uh a austere version of simplicity if if we think that there's there's problems coming out of that so maybe they're not th those who would not want to say hey i i want to bring in relational theism or I want to, um, I want to buy some credibility with those in culture, but instead say, "Hey, I've I've looked at classical theism, much like you came from relational theism into classical." Those who start in classical and say, "Hey, there's some things that I can't really make sense of here." Um, what what would you say to those folks? Like, do, do they need to? If you if you think, yeah, yeah, sorry. Well, what, I would, what would say, say two things. Number one, there are supposed to be some things you can't make sense out of. Sure. And the whole the whole skill and art of philosophy is figuring out where to put the mystery. Mm -hmm. Like, you, if you want to be a complete rationalist, well, then Christianity is doomed. There is no possible way to retain Christianity if you're going to be a complete rationalist and explain everything rationally. Like, that's great. Yeah, that's a great point. And and so, 
So you, where figuring out where to put the mystery is the issue. You, you mm -hmm. don't want to put it too soon right. and leave unexplored possible answers that are out there waiting to be found. Yeah. But you don't want to put it too late and rationalize away the, the uniqueness of Christianity. So figuring yeah. out exactly how far to go and no further is exactly what it's all about. Yeah. And that's the point that I want to make is yeah. you are not the first generation to want to do this. <laughs> like, like this, you in the fourth century in my book in chapter um, eight, I think it is, um, I talk about the debate between Eunomius and Basil of Caesarea in the fourth century. And the debate was exactly, a, it, it reminds me so much of modern philosophy because Eunomius wants to define God as ingenerate. He wants to define God. And he says, and, he, and he's very, he's very adamant that God, the father is ingenerate. That's what, that's what he is. I understand it. I rationally comprehend it. Hmm. And you, Basil of Caesarea says, well, look, you cannot rationally comprehend God. It's true that God is ingenerate, but the Trinity is ingenerate. And there is a mystery as to how God can be both simple and triune. Mm -hmm. And what we're what we're trying to do is to, all that the all that the Cappadocian fathers claimed to have done was to was to 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 affirm to confess in, in a creed our faith that according to the Bible we must believe the, that to believe the biblical religion is to believe that the triune God is simple. Mm -hmm. The son belongs on the deity side of the God world divide, right. not on the world side. And that the, and this is why the creed says that the father beget, that the son is begotten, not made. Right. Made is what the triune God does to the creation. Mm -hmm. Begetting is what the father does to the son. And that the begetting is within the divine simplicity. Eunomius will not accept that. Yeah. He will not because it doesn't rationally make sense to him. How can the begetting of the son be eternal? And so he's, he says, if the son is begotten, that he's not ingenerate. We've got to go on the other side of the divide. And Basil says, at the end of the day, there is no rational way to completely comprehend this mystery mm -hmm. of the Trinity. The three hypostases are one usia. What does that mean? It means that a hypostasis is not identical with an usia, but that they are one. And mm -hmm. you say, well, I don't understand how they're different. You're not supposed to. Mm. If you understand how they're different, you're into social Trinitarianism, polytheism. You, you cannot, there, there is a mystery. There's a, there's a, there's a, you can go so far on this journey and then there's a stop sign and you have to stop there. Yeah. Your choice is either to go forward and rationalize away the mystery and you end up with nothing to worship or you, you, um, or you stop and you worship. Theology ends, it terminates in worship. Theology does not terminate in rational comprehension of God. Hmm. It terminates in the worship of the triune mystery. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, yeah, that's actually your, your last um, your last thesis is the purpose of theology is neither to dissolve nor explain the mysteries of the faith. Rather, the purpose of theology is to define what the church believes, teaches, and confesses about these mysteries to enable contemplation and worship of God while avoiding heresy. So we still do get contemplation, that contemplation that leads to worship. And what I what I like also, you and some of your other theses, you talk about the transcendent creator, you talk about analogical predication. And uh, yeah, incomprehensibility. And so the stopping point, for, as you said earlier, finding the, where to put the mystery, it's not ad hoc. It's not, you know, we're, we're just running out of our, our, our rope here. It's there's actual theological doctrines that cause us to stop at these points. And they make sense. It makes sense that a transcendent creator wouldn't make perfect sense to us. It makes sense that because he's knowable, but not uh, comprehensible, fully comprehensible, then we wouldn't be able to fully understand his nature. And so I, I, I love that aspect of, of Christian theology. So what, and, and one rule that we follow is that in Orthodox theology, there can be paradox, but never contradiction. Yeah. Mysteries are paradoxes, not contradictions. That's very important. If somebody, if, if somebody does mount the challenge and says, yeah, your doctrine of the Trinity is contradictory, we must show that that's not true. Yeah. We, we, because we, 
we are rational people. We believe that God is has created the world with order and structure and reason. We we don't think that God is um, is we don't think that our belief, our faith as Christians, is not con- is not contradictory. Mm-hmm. And so um, <clears throat> so this is part of what the debate was about in the fourth century. It was all about figuring out how to state the faith in such a way that we avoid all contradictions. But that we that's a paradox, remember, is an apparent contradiction, right? Not a real contradiction. Mm-hmm. And it's that it's distinguishing the one from the other that was so much a part of the debate. Yeah. You're, you're touching on a, another modern debate here between James Anderson and J.C. Beale. And Anderson says, you know, it's it's a warranted paradox, makes sense. And J.C. Beale's coming on in a couple of weeks to talk about his contradictory Christology, and he's a he's a logician, and he's saying yes, Christ is a contradictory contradictory being, but that's totally fine because his system of logic. So it's blowing my mind reading his book. Uh, well, I'll have to I'll have to do a lot of work to to think through that one. But um, yeah, I'm with you. I, I think that it is a paradox, and it's a warranted paradox. Makes sense. It's warranted because the creator creature distinction. It makes sense that this uh, God's nature, the nature of the creator, the author of the story, is paradoxical to us. Yeah. Yeah, the, the law of non-contradiction, you know, um, is discovered by Aristotle, but I think it's true. I think it's true as well, yeah. And so we, one of the funny thing, one of the ironies that I find in this is that uh, the same people who tell me that, um, well, we, we can't accept this Greek metaphysical idea, um, they themselves want to presuppose that, of course, modern science is true. Yeah. Like, like they... But where do where do, do they get their modern science out of the Bible? No, no more than we get Aristotelian metaphysics out of the Bible. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a uh, you you could pick your metaphysics is what what I'm saying, but you can't you can't just um, nobody just nobody just reads the Bible and does not have any metaphysical um, right. uh, ideas at all, and and nobody limits himself or herself to just the Bible. Like mm-hmm. we all believe in modern medicine. We all believe that modern medicine is true. Like we go to the doctor and we get we get needles and we have operations. I mean, we believe it. Yeah, it's obvious that we believe it. I got my my vaccine shot, and because uh, I believe in I believe that modern science works. And um, so I think that um, that the idea that we can't take an the, the the premise that we cannot take an idea from outside the Bible, and and deem it to be compatible with what the Bible teaches and be true. It's just nonsense. Yeah. So, so all of this. So you can't. Nobody impresses me by saying, "Oh, that's a Greek idea." As if that settles the argument. Now we go throw it out. And right. no, you, you got to show me that it's a Greek idea that it is wrong. Yeah, yeah. C.S. Lewis wrote an article called uh, "Bulverism," which which does the same thing. He's he's addressing that point that you just address. You, it's it's kind of like the uh, the uh, root fa- or the genetic fallacy. You just oh, I pointed out where that idea came from. So oh, now I'm supposed to drop it. Well, you haven't done the hard work of showing. Okay, just it, ideas that come from there are wrong, or this idea in particular is wrong. So I think that's a, a fantastic. Way especially when you want me to drop ideas that come from Aristotle while you yourself hold other ideals that come from Aristotle. Right. Right. And think that you're justified in doing so, but I'm not. Okay. Right. We'll explain that. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. We need to adjudicate between the two. Well, Dr. Carter, thanks so much for all your time. Again, like I told everyone at the beginning, we could do this forever. It's already been an hour and 13. Uh, I would love to do this again. I'd love to talk more about this book or about your, your upcoming metaphysics book. Um, I really appreciate you. I wish we could have got through more of these theses. Maybe I'll put them in the description, uh, or they can follow you on Twitter, where you've you've tweeted them all out. Yeah, I uh, I do, uh, and I post on Twitter when I uh, post a, um, a Substack uh, newsletter. I I do that weekly. I'm trying to do that weekly now. That I, um, so yeah, um, I'd be glad to come back again. A, a couple of things we can we can talk about Isaiah. We you know, yes, Isaiah picks up a third of this book, but we didn't get into Isaiah, so uh, right. but we can yeah. talk about that sometime. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be fantastic. All right. Well, um, this uh, this is going to have to do it for now, folks, but uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll continue this conversation. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.